a lot of talk about your appearance so far this season. You're doing the uh, you're doing the the do different uh, from time to time. Yeah, cut it all off after the off season. Um, new year hit. I said new year, new me. So just shaved it all off, and then uh, yeah, when I came to spring training, shaved off the beard. But yeah, I'm back in character now. Okay, I like it. How about the nails? What do we get? What do we got? Just going regular there? white right just now. Just regular white Good right now. Good for the weather. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, I might mix in like a couple blues, a couple different blues. I might even pop out like a royal blue for no reason. But okay. I'm going to stick with team colors, but even yellow is the team colors. So. Now, do you do that yourself? or do you? I, I'm often told, Courtney says I ought to get manis and petties uh, on the regular. Yeah. Um, do you do it yourself or do you? Uh... During the season, I typically do it myself. Do. Um, yeah, typically I don't have like a, a day that I can just pop out in the morning and go get them done. So I'll just do them in my, in my, in my tub. You need a guy. Bathroom. Like the Red Sox should get you a guy. Like a nail guy. Uh, I am the guy. You're the guy. So, <laughs> you are, you are the, guy the guy. I'm the guy for it. You so. are the guy. Yeah, I, I just sit in the tub with my remover, and then I'll do it, and then, you know, sit. And then when I get in bed, like, I'll just carefully put the sheets over, and then I'll, like, lay <laughs> the on the worst, bed like, right? a, like a zombie. <laughs> and then that'll be my air dry. <laughs> Well, we love it, and we're we're excited. We've been talking here for three days with guys who uh, are talking about how this team uh, has a little bit of a, a chip on their shoulder. Maybe is a is a way to to describe it. You feel that way going into the season? I feel like that's the, that's the motto of the city. I feel like everybody's got a little chip on their shoulder. Blue collar and blue collar, definitely city. But um, yeah, I don't know why we're underlooked or overlooked. I mean, we have such a great ball ball, ball club. So much uh, talent in that locker room. Young, old. Everything in between staff, uh, front office, coaching, uh, I think it's uh, top of the line. So I don't know why we're underdogs. I don't know why we're overlooked. But everybody in that clubhouse, we know that we have the potential to win a World Series. So I think we're all excited for this year. Speaking of Boston and Massachusetts and a chip on its shoulder, uh, Wiggy, not a fan of your home state, Florida. Uh, I just want to uh, – doesn't – has been here only two days, two and a half days – and thinks it's all strip malls. So I don't want you to take any offense at that, but you might be able to tell them differently having grown up here. Yeah, I don't think I, – I would never move from here. Um, I love the warm weather all year round. I I, uh, I think everything about Florida is great. Um, I think it's getting a little crowded, so if he wants to go, he can. I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. <laughs> right, good, good. We don't have room for you is what well, he's I'm saying. Well, I'm a asshole. What do you expect? Uh, yes. Born and <laughs> I'm a asshole. But being from Florida, you have said that you would you would do your whole career in Boston, that you love playing for the Red Sox, that you would want to be here forever. What makes it special about the Red Sox, about Boston, about the front office, that you would want to play for them? I think it's from the top down. Every Everybody just holds each other accountable. accountable. Um, the leadership throughout all the tiers um, is super organized. I love how it's just a comfortable, conducive environment for growth. Every single day that I come to the park, I'm always learning um, from everybody, uh, from top down, even from myself and, and, and everybody in between. So I think it's just a great environment for me to keep getting better as a player, but also as a person too. Uh, but just in terms of Boston, I love playing there. Um, the aura about it, the, the history of the, of the city, of the team, um, of the ballpark, Everything about it, I love it, and and the fans bring the energy, you know, every single night, whether we were winning or losing last year. So I can only imagine a playoff atmosphere. I'm really hungry for it. So um, I love everything about the city team. Um, so I'd love to stay here for my whole career. It'd be an honor. And you, you talk about that. You're really hungry for it, and I, I think the biggest thing is when you look at a team, you look at players coming together, and and you said leadership in that clubhouse. What's the overall? Uh, I guess, hunger for being the underdog or, like you said, everybody doubting you. What, what's what been the overall message in the clubhouse for you guys as a group and as a team? That we're going to go out there and we're going to kick ass one day at a time. Uh, I don't think there's any expectation for anything else except for today. Um, we set a really high expectation for today, getting better each and every day, every single moment, practice, rep, um, however we can improve together as a team and individually, we're going to try to do it. Uh, but for the whole outlook of the year is, um, is to win a World Series. I wouldn't strap on these cleats if I didn't think we had a chance to. Uh, I wouldn't even waste my time going out there. And I don't think anybody else feels that. Uh, that's that way that we're going to go out there and get outmatched by anybody. So I think going into the season, we're all really, really confident. We have a good mindset going in, and it's just about going out there and executing because we know we have the talent. Speaking of expectations, Rafael Devers said he expects you to be one of the best players in the league this season. Is that a uh, little added pressure? 
No, not at all. I, I put that expectation on myself every day when I wake up, so I don't think he's too far-fetched by saying that. Whether it's going to happen or not, I'm not sure. Uh, I, uh, I'm i going to go out there and give my best effort every single day. I'm going to play hard, smart, fast, like I know how to do. And, uh, you know, I, I want I – want, my my one of my goals this year was to help him win an MVP. So that's funny that he said that. I think he has that caliber of player, and I think if he puts it, puts it together, um, you know, offensively we know he's capable of, and defensively I'm the one who's going to make the difference for him to win that. So um, I need I, I need to help him out there too. Well, you finished strong when it came to AL Rookie of the Year voting, and and when you reach that high, then people start saying sophomore slump, sophomore slump. What have you done during the off season to make sure that that doesn't happen for you? It's going to happen again. I'm going to slump again and I'm going to fail. Uh, hopefully everybody's as patient as they were the first time. But I think uh, just understanding what I'm trying to do every single day when I go to the field is a little more calming right now. I, I think going through the going through the league one time uh, really helped me. I mean, I was going to all these ballparks that I had grown up watching on TV and playing against all my favorite players growing up and first time through the league I was going west coast east coast and I was a little starstruck by these guys um, you know because I'm I'm watching them I'm playing them against them for the first time but once I realized that they swing at pitches in the dirt and they strike out and have bad at bats and boot balls in the field it kind of eased me uh, and and I feel like that carried over into my second half where I could just take a deep breath, calm the, calm myself and slow the game down and realize that I'm just as good as they are out on the field. So, um, yeah, going into the offseason, I was working on a lot of different things uh, mentally, physically, that I feel like I'm going to carry over into the season. Hopefully the learning curve's a little shorter this time around. The mental that, part? Sorry. That, well, that does have to be wild, though, when you're you're watching a guy growing up and you're you're idolizing him and then he's on first base. I mean, do you do you say is it like the old like the Chris Farley show where you're like, oh man, I've been watching you for your whole career. I love you. Like, what, uh, do, you, what do you say to a guy? The the elite players, I uh, I do a a little tribute to them every single time that they get on first base. I'm not gonna name drop them, but <laughs> I will take my hat off and I'll 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 subtly say, hey, this tip of the cap is for you. You're one of the best players of my generation. It's an honor to share this field with you. I'll say something along those really? lines. That's awesome. And it comes off well. It comes off well. They appreciate it. Um, I'm a little I'm a little bit of a baseball historian myself. I, I, I know the facts of the game. I know how much each player means to it. And, and now playing it, I know how hard it is. So I have a lot of respect for those players on the other side. But, you know, that's, that's not that I'm going to take them lightly. What's the oddest thing that you've talked to a guy about when he's when he's on first base? They bring up the family ish, the like if they're fighting with their wife, or do they do they bring like what do you guys talk about? Um, that that you know that's like locker room talk. That's the first time. You know, it's okay. I, I can't right. disclose any of that okay. stuff because sometimes right. we'll be talking smack about about even the the own guy our our own guys on our own team. You know? so, well, it, it's, I try to keep it light. I, I really, whenever guys get to first base, it's typically for a good reason, whether it's a walk or a hit. So I'll try to always be paying attention every at bat to something that they themselves would have only noticed. So, um, Let's say they walked, right? And in a 2-1 count, they took a nice backdoor curveball to get to two strikes, and then they had two good takes. When they get on first, I'll typically say something like, hey, I, I like that one strike take to get to two strikes even though you could have put it in play and he induced weak contact like the pitcher wanted you to you stayed patient and then you took two more after that when you could have got antsy so then he'll be like oh i i, I appreciate that typically don't notice that angle so i'll try to notice something like super specific uh, even if it's whether about a, even if it's about a stance if i've played a guy for a long time like oh i like this or i'll just try to nitpick on something that um i like and typically it's a compliment if they get on first base so that's what i like see i try to lull about. them into a false sense of security and say you can take a huge lead off this guy don't worry about it <laughs> that is that is part of playing first base the distraction aspect okay. so <laughs> along with that i also feel like i i've been playing first base for so long i know when a guy's gonna steal too so i tip it to the catcher you know typically when they get all quiet and they're focused and they're taking their lead i'm like oh hey step off uh, let's let's redo this let's think hey he's bigger lead whatever so um yeah I, uh it's more about hey where's the hot spots for after the game <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. where's our club at distract them yeah distract them yeah we get into that too yeah. yeah you bring up the mental aspect of the off season and i think we talk about this a lot with wiggy because baseball is so different than every other sport where 
where the mental part, I think, maybe sometimes is just as important, if not more, than the physical aspect. How do you, as a baseball player, focus on on that and make sure that you are in the right headspace for baseball? It's a difficult concept to grasp when you can do everything right and still have a bad result. And you can do everything wrong and have a good one. So it's super important to stay level-headed. Um, I, I like to always take the approach of whatever happened was supposed to and just try to run with it. Uh, I feel like I've, uh, I've tapped into a lot of different techniques about how to be present, what success means to me and what failure means to me. Um, and there comes a burden with both of them. And, and however long you carry that burden with you becomes your ego, right? So you are successful and people expect a lot out of you. Um, that can weigh on you. And when you're a failure and you're, you know, you're not doing as well as you expect yourself to, that can weigh on you as well. So however long you want to carry that success with you is up to you. But I like to carry it for the millisecond that the ball's hitting my bat. After that, while I'm rounding the bases, I'm giving high fives to my teammates. I don't have that success anymore. It's about the next play. It's about somehow maybe be relaying a little piece of information of how I was able to have that little bit of success to a teammate because if I roll over to second base I come into the dugout and I walk past the guy at the water cooler and then I walk past the coach at the top step and then I walk past the guy who's going out to hit right now that's three different guys that I could have helped somehow with my failure that I didn't because I was moping so, so that's that's the mental side of it that I'm working on is how to turn the page how to be present how to always just try to be positive no matter what and spin anything negative um, into some type of learning experience. So I think uh, that's going to be the focus for this year. And, and that's the leadership aspect of it where we can all somehow integrate that mindset and, and, and feel like every day, is, every day is a new opportunity to keep getting better. Alex Cora had Keith Lockhart speak to you guys yesterday. Are you willing to return the favor and do like a some kind of uh, pregame pump up for the Boston Symphony Orchestra at some point? Yeah, definitely. I, I don't know how to how to. I feel like in the in in that type of environment, you have to be more zen, more relaxed. I feel like to go out and play baseball, you got to be a little pumped up. But yeah, I, I loved hearing what he had to say. Um, just the leader of of that orchestra that group um for so many years i felt like there was so many similarities between him and ac um just how many things he has to juggle how intricate every single little note has to be perfect for the sound to be great and um i think it was just a good good perspective uh for everybody else to understand like this is this is you know pretty standard leadership from the top down where it's not a tier system where one person is holding each other accountable. Um, Cause that was one thing that I asked. I said, how do you differentiate which person is messing up? Cause you can have six or seven players playing the same instrument, but how do you, he's like, I don't, the environment and the, the culture that I've built is everybody's holding each other accountable. So I don't even need to say to that person, the person next to that person knows that they're messing up because they can hear it and they'll nudge them before I have to. Mm. So that was what I gained out of it. And it's just a, a, a culture thing of, uh, you know, just holding each other accountable. Tristan, so you said earlier about the, you have the great team, great manager, great coaches. So Cora's is in the final year of his deal. Uh, what would you think as a member of the Red Sox playing for a different manager than Alex Cora next season? I can't imagine it just because I haven't, I haven't done it. Um, he, he's the backbone of the organization. I think he's such, such a great example for everybody in and out, in and outside of the clubhouse. I think inside of there, he's, he's always really active. Um, he's displaying exactly what he preaches he never expects results he's always about um all the things that i've been treating uh, uh preaching right now attitude effort energy um those are all very controllable things and and he doesn't he doesn't ask too much of us and he's always honest he's always honest he shoots me straight which is exactly what i want from my manager i don't want him to sugarcoat anything i don't want him to hide um behind any doors he he's very upfront with with what he likes and what he doesn't and and that's who i want at the helm um when things are going bad he's always super level-headed and i think he's just the right right guy for the job he was he was on with us a couple of days ago talking about how you know really from his perspective gotta gotta fix the defense this season um he put it on himself um do you feel that that that's on you guys or that's on on alex well that's that's the great thing about our uh 
that's the great thing about our organization. I feel like if there's failure, we all accept we all accept responsibility for it. So from my from my perspective, I feel like the infield defense last year was my fault. I felt like it was all my fault. If you look at the two last World Series teams with the Diamondbacks and the Rangers, both the catcher and first base position had their respective leagues gold glove winners from those teams, Nathaniel Lowe and Christian Walker, as lo- as well as Jonah Heim and Gabriel Moreno. They were all, all gold glove winners. So I think at a certain point, the first base and catching position has to be elite for your team to be successful. Um, and I, I, it starts with me at, at first base, helping everybody out and instilling the confidence into my infielders that they just have to throw it over there and I'll hopefully do the job with my size and, and length. And you want to be elite this season. That's that's the plan. That's the yes. plan. Yep. All right. I love it. Well, All right. Well, listen, thanks for taking the time. We'll let you go. And, and you're over the flu? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Over it. It was uh, bad? Uh, I had uh, back pains for no reason, just general body soreness, oh. a lot of congestion in my face. Um, thankfully, I didn't didn't lose my appetite, so I didn't lose any weight. I uh, never lose my appetite. Yeah. I don't know if you can tell or not, but <laughs> no, you, uh, I look good. Yeah, All right, yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, and you uh, uh. you playing tomorrow? Yes. You're playing tomorrow? Yeah. Oh. All right, awesome. Well, thanks for taking the time this morning, and hopefully we'll talk to you again during the season. Thank you.